We are the people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. Our work is guided by the sense that we may be the last generation in the experiment with living, but we are a minority. The vast majority of our people regard the temporary equilibriums of our society and world as eternally functional parts. In this is perhaps the outstanding paradox. We ourselves are imbued with urgency, yet the message of our society is that there is no viable alternative to the present. Because a lot of people are on the 40th anniversary are saying that they see some real comparisons between 68 and 2008. Unpopular war for the first time, you know, political leadership that looks quite That's inspirational. Correct. I mean, is, is there a parallel? Do you there is, but you don't have the intensity of, uh, 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 that you had because w Vietnam was, was causing two or three hundred American deaths a week. Um, as a result of Vietnam and the neglect of the inner cities, uh, black people were rebelling I think in 75 or 80 cities, especially after the death of King. So nothing like that exists now. However, the movement uh, that has chosen Barack Obama is similar in that you have a very unified black community and an unprecedented um, uh, youth turnout. The 60s left a cultural legacy recognition of the rights of minorities, recognition of women, gays, lesbians, the environment, and on that level I think the 60s had a huge, huge effect. In 1962, 60 idealistic young people came together at a retreat at the base of Lake Huron with some big ideas on their mind. These young students were members of a group called Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. They were not impressed by the hopefulness of the Kennedy era and found much to be uncomfortable about, including the Cold War, the plight of Negroes, the power of corporations, and the danger of nuclear Armageddon. The idea in Port Huron was to clarify and proclaim the new organization's values and agenda. The resulting document, drafted primarily by student activist Tom Hayden, was called the Port Huron Statement. Young Tom Hayden was a smart brat who compensated for a lack of personal charm with the inventiveness of his early rebellions. Hayden was born in Detroit in 1939 and grew up in the middle class. He attended Michigan State where he was editor of the newspaper and was one of the founding members of the leftist student group SDS. Hayden was not always liked, but often respected. Many kinds of people resent Hayden for various conflicting reasons but honest ones should admire his performance and wish they had done something similar. After the college years and SDS were behind him, Hayden continued to be active. He was heavily involved in anti-Vietnam protests and served 18 years in the California State Legislature. He has written or edited 18 books and currently writes for The Nation magazine. He has had an influential and successful political career but he is still most well known for his role as an activist and his ideas are cemented in history by SDS and the Port Huron Statement. The Port Huron Statement was a primary force in shaping the new left and its ideas are still applicable today. In fact, its call for participatory democracy is one that has been recently echoed in many ways by the Occupy movement. The chief point I want to make is that the core message that was understood at Port Huron and delivered by our authors uh, was a, a lasting message that is well worth re-examining today uh, for the Occupy movement or for all kinds of single issue movement. The core message of the document was participatory democracy. We seek the establishment of a democracy of individual participation governed by two central aims, that the individual share in these social decisions determining the quality and direction of his life, and that society be organized to encourage independence in men and provide the media for their common participation. The central idea of participatory democracy is just as relevant today as it was in the 60s. Participatory democracy sought to expand the sphere of public decisions from the mere election of representatives to the deeper role of bringing people out of isolation and into community in decentralized forms of decision-making. 
The fact that it introduced the concept of participatory democracy into popular discourse is possibly the most important legacy of the Port Huron Statement. It points to the timeless fact that ordinary people can make history and don't have to wait for parties or traditional organizations. For participatory democracy, it, it is a concept that embodies a method and a goal that is more inclusive, I would argue, than other uh, more ideological uh, uh, concepts that people uh, in progressive movements or the left have identified themselves with. But again and again, the resilience of this concept uh, keeps coming back. You see it in the September 17th uh, uh, initial principles of Occupy Wall Street. The first, and the first primary principle is for a direct and transparent participatory democracy. You see it in the students in Tunisia. You see it in the students in Egypt calling for democracy. And, 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 and it's clear that while the meaning of democracy in those places is yet to be fully uh, defined, if it, if it ever is, uh, it, it, it was participatory democracy as both a, a means and an end, that it took direct action, it took the occupation of Tahrir Square, uh, it took the full participation of the excluded to begin to move the, the uh, heavy weight of the military dictatorship and the institutions in those countries. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's about direct action, it's about voting, it's about protecting voting rights from people who would whittle them away, but it's also about a voice for workers at the factory, it's about a voice for neighbors, it's about a voice for citizens in foreign policy, it's, a vo it's about a voice for students uh, as these de as decisions are made about tuition and the cost of higher education. It, 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 that's the concept. It's a big concept. Not, it, it, it's not definable merely as small groups seeking consensus together, although that too uh, has been part of the tradition from the Quakers to the early uh, sit-ins. Some would have us believe that Americans feel contentment amidst prosperity, but might it not be better called a glaze above deeply felt anxieties about their role in the new world? And if these anxieties produce a developed indifference to human affairs, do they not as well produce a yearning to believe there is an alternative to the present? That something can be done to change the circumstances in the school, the workplaces, the bureaucracies, the government? It is to this latter yearning, at once the spark and engine of change, that we direct our present appeal. The search for truly democratic alternatives to the present and a commitment to social experimentation with them is a worthy and fulfilling human enterprise, one which moves us and, we hope, others today. On such a basis do we offer this document of our convictions and analysis as an effort in understanding and changing the conditions of humanity in the late 20th century, an effort rooted in the ancient, still unfulfilled conception of man attaining determining influence over his own circumstances of life.